Hey all, welcome to the video for module 6.1.1. In this one, we're just gonna do a brief overview of muscle tissue and some skeletal muscles. Uh, keep in mind as we're going through this that all skeletal muscle tissue is derived from the mesoderm. And muscle tissue is one of the four principal tissue types that consist chiefly of muscle cells that are highly specialized for contractions. And without the three types of muscle tissues, the skeletal muscle, the smooth muscle, and the cardiac muscle, nothing in the body would move. So let's get into this. <clears throat> Like I just mentioned, there are three types of muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle tissue can be found attached to bones. It accounts for nearly 40% of the body mass. Um, the cells are long, cylindrically shaped. They're multinucleated with the nuclei that are peripheral located. Um, these are voluntary. They possess striations and usually react with quick twitches and short contractions. Skeletal muscles have many functions, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Next, we have smooth muscle tissue, which is found throughout the body and the walls of the hollow organs of the digestive tract, the respiratory, urinary, the reproductive tract, the walls of blood vessels, and then the erector pili muscles of the skin. The cells are usually short and spindle-shaped. They lack striations and intercalated discs and have only one single nucleus per cell. They demonstrate slow twitches and long contractions, and smooth muscle helps to move food, urine, reproductive secretions throughout the body. They control the diameter of respiratory passageways, and they regulate the diameter of blood vessels. Lastly, we have cardiac muscle tissue, and that's found only in the heart. These cells are short and branched. They're usually uninucleated, but occasionally can be binucleated. They're involuntary. They possess striations and intercalated discs. They're intermediate twitches with an intermediate contraction. Cardiac muscle moves blood and maintains blood pressure. To get into some of the functions of skeletal muscle tissue, which you can see here. Number one, um, skeletal muscles produce movement. Skeletal muscles contraction, pull on tendons, and move bones of the skeleton. The effects range from a simple motion, such as extending the arm or breathing, to highly coordinated movements. Skeletal muscles also maintain posture and body positioning. Tension in skeletal muscle maintains body posture, for example, holding your head still when you read a book or balancing your body weight above your feet as you walk. And without constant muscular activity, you can neither sit upright nor stand. They also support soft tissue. The abdominal wall of the floor of the pelvic cavity consists of layers of skeletal muscle and these muscles support the weight of visceral organs and shield the internal organ tissues from injury. Skeletal muscles also guard entrances and exits. So the opening of the digestive and urinary tracts are encircled by skeletal muscles, and that muscle is called a sphincter, and that provides voluntary control over swallowing, defecation, and urination. They also help to maintain and regulate body temperature. Muscle contractions require energy, and whenever energy is used in the body, some of it's converted to heat. The heat released by working muscles keeps body temperature in the range required for normal functioning. And approximately 85% of the body's heat is produced by skeletal muscle tissue. Lastly, they provide nutrient reserves. When the diet contains inadequate protein or calories, the contractile proteins in skeletal muscle are broken down into amino acids, which then release into circulation. Some of these amino acids can be used by the liver to synthesize glucose, and others can be broken down to provide energy. So talking about some of the functional characteristics of skeletal muscle tissue, um, we can get into the definition of some of these. Excitability means that skeletal muscle responds to stimulation by nerves and hormones. Contractility is the capacity of muscles to contract or shorten forcefully. Extensibility means that skeletal muscle fibers can be stretched beyond their normal resting length. And elasticity means that if stretched, they can return to their original resting length. Going over some of the anatomy of the skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle tissue is highly vascularized and highly innervated. And because skeletal muscle tissue has a high metabolic rate, it needs a continuous supply of oxygen and nutrients for the bloodstream. Because skeletal muscle tissue is voluntary, each muscle must have a nerve that innervates each cell to stimulate a contraction. There are a few connective tissue layers associated with muscle tissue, specifically the epimecium, the paramecium, and the endomecium. And at the ends of skeletal muscle, collagen fibers of the connective tissue layers merge to form either a bundle that's called a tendon or a broad sheet known as an aponeurosis. And these help anchor the muscle to the bone. Speaking specifically on those three muscle layers of the connective tissue, you have the epimecium, which is a dense layer of collagen fiber that surrounds the entire muscle. The epimecium separates the muscle from the surrounding tissues and organs. It's connected to the deep fascia, which is a dense connective tissue layer. We also have the paramecium, which is a fibrous layer that divides the skeletal muscle into a series of bundles called fascicles. In addition to possessing collagen and elastic fibers, the paramecium contains blood vessels and nerves that help to maintain blood flow and innervate the muscle fiber within the fascicle. And lastly, we have the endomecium. The endomecium is a delicate connective tissue that surrounds the individual skeletal muscles or muscle fibers and loosely interconnects adjacent muscle fibers. 
Muscle fibers are unique cells. A single skeletal muscle is composed of large bundles called fascicles. Each fascicle is composed of a number of muscle cells, also called muscle fibers, because they are long and cylindrically shaped. Each muscle fiber is composed of myofibrils. Each myofibril is composed of two contractile proteins that are called myofilaments. The thick myofilaments are called myosin, and the thin myofilaments are called actin. The myofilaments of myosin and actin are arranged in overlapping patterns to create hundreds of thousands of functional units called sarcomeres. Some of the microscopic anatomy of the skeletal muscle, um, moving from the gross anatomy, the cytoplasm of a muscle cell is called the sarcoplasm. Sarcoplasm of the skeletal muscle is more mitochondria than the average body cell and large amounts of myoglobin, which is a protein in the storage of oxygen. The plasma membrane of a muscle cell is called the sarcolemma, and the sarcolemma possesses numerous invaginations that extend deep into the sarcoplasm at right angles to the cell surface. And these invaginations are called transverse tubules, or T-tubules for short. The T-tubules form passageways through the muscle cells that allow electrical impulses that are generated at the surface of the cell to travel into the cell's interior. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, or the SR, is similar to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of other body cells, and it helps to form a tubular network that surrounds each myofibril. The membrane of the SR contains ion pumps that pump calcium ions from the cytosol into the SR, where some of the calcium then binds to a protein called calcioclestrin. On either side of a T-tubule, the tubules of the SR enlarge, they fuse, and then they form expanded chambers used in the storage of calcium ions called the terminal cisternae. One T-tubule plus the terminal cisternae located on either side of the T-tubule forms a triad. We're going to go a little bit more in depth into what we just talked about there. Um, so just to rehash that, remember the plasma membrane of a muscle cell is called the sarcolemma, and the sarcolemma has those invaginations that go into the sarcoplasm and <clears throat> Those imaginations are called the T-tubules. A little bit more in-depth than the myofibrils. Myofibrils are lengthwise subdivisions within the muscle fiber made, as, made up of bundles of proteins, again, the myofilaments, and the myofilaments are responsible for that muscle contraction. So getting into some of the anatomy of the myofilaments. Each thin filament of actin, is composed of several interacting proteins. So you have F-actin, or filamentous actin, which is a twisted strand composed of two rows of 300 to 400 individual molecules of G-actin. G-actin, or globular actin, is a rounded, compact molecule protein that possesses an active site where one myosin molecule can bind. You have nebulin, which is a long strand of protein that extends along the F-actin strand in the cleft between the rows of the G-actin molecules. The nebulin helps to stabilize the F-actin strands. You have tropomyosin, which is a double-stranded protein that covers the active sites of the G-actin and arresting muscle. This prevents the actin and the myosin fibers from interacting when you don't want them to. You have troponin, which is a protein containing three globular subunits and is strategically placed along the tropomyosin. We'll talk a little bit more about troponin in a little bit. Each of the globular subunits possesses an active site to bind calcium ions. And when calcium ions bind the troponin, troponin changes its shape, which in turn causes the tropomyosin to swivel, thereby revealing the active site on the G-actin so that the myosin and actin can form what's called a cross bridge. Again, the types of myofilaments are the thin myofilaments, which are made of actin, and the thick myofilaments made of myosin. Just to rehash transverse tubules, they help to transmit the action potential through the cell. They allow the entire muscle fiber to contract simultaneously. They have some properties such as the sarcolemma and the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the terminal cisternae, and T-tubules. A little bit more on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's a membranous structure that surrounds each myofibril. It helps to transmit that action potential that we were just talking about, and we'll talk more about action potentials a little bit later and into the next unit as well. Um, they're also similar in structure to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and they help to form chambers called the terminal cisternae that attach to the T-tubules. Right, let's talk a little bit more about the anatomy of the sarcomere, which is the functional or contractile unit of skeletal muscles. Each myofibril contains approximately 10,000 sarcomeres, um, each with a resting length of about 2 micrometers. Each sarcomere is comp uh, composed of very specific arrangement of the myofilaments of actin and myosin. So the A-band is a dense region of the sarcomere that contains overlapping thick and thin filaments of both myosin and actin. On either side of the A-band is an area that contains only thin filaments called the I-band. 
in the middle of each A-band is an area that contains only thick filaments called the H-band. The M-line, which is located in the middle of each H-band, anchors the central portion of each thick filament. And then the Z-line mark the boundaries between the adjacent sarcomeres. The Z-lines consist of proteins called actinins, which anchor the thin filaments of adjacent sarcomeres. Again, the sarcomere is the contractile unit of the muscle. They are structural units of myofibrils. They help to form visible patterns within the myofibrils and create those striations that we talked about earlier, which are just striped or striated patterns within the myofibrils. They are also alternating dark, thick filaments, A-bands, and light, thin filaments, which are the I-bands. A little bit more on the M-lines and the Z-lines. The M-line, again, is the midline of the sarcomere where the thick filaments meet, and the Z-line is the two ends of the sarcomere where the thin filaments meet. Titan is strands of proteins that help to reach from the thick filaments to the Z-line to help stabilize those filaments. <clears throat> Before we get into that, I just want to talk a little bit more about the thick filament of myosin that's composed of roughly about 300 myosin molecules. Remember that myosin molecules are made up of a pair of myosin subunits that are twisted around each other. The myosin subunits all have a tail portion that's connected to a free head portion. The tail portion of the free heads are connected by a hinge that allows that head to pivot at its base. A single thick filament is composed of about 300 of those, again, <clears throat> And they have their tails pointed towards the M line and the myosin head arranged in a spiral so that they can face the thick filaments. At the core of each thick filament is that titan, which we just mentioned, which has an elastic and, or, I'm sorry, which is elastic and recoils after stretching. In the resting sarcomere, the titan strands are completely relaxed and they become tense only when some external force stretches the sarcomere. And that helps to lead us into the sliding filament mechanism or sliding filament theory. So, attachment of myosin cross bridges with an arresting muscle is inhibited by the presence of tropomyosin, which, remember, covers the active sites of the G-myectin. If calcium ions are released from the terminal cisternae by the action potential, they bind to troponin and change its shape. The troponin then pulls on the tropomyosin, so the binding sites on actin are exposed. Once the active site is exposed, the high-energy myosin heads attach to the actin to form that cross bridge. The subsequent release of ADP and phosphate from the high energy myosin head causes the head to pivot and bend as it pulls on the actin filament, which causes it to slide towards the midline. And this is called the power stroke. It's equivalent to the contraction of the muscle. As new ATP attaches to the now low energy myosin head, because remember it released ADP, the myosin head then detaches from the actin. ATP is split to form ADP and phosphate, and the bond energy is then transferred to the myosin head, causing it to move in the high energy position so that it's ready to bind to the actin binding sites once again. Then when the action potential dissipates, the calcium is reabsorbed back into the terminal cisternae. And when this occurs, the tropomyosin moves back over the active sites of the G-actin so that, that cross bridge formation can no longer occur, and then the muscle then re relaxes. One last thing about the sliding filament model. When a sarcomere contracts, the Z-lines move closer together, and the I-band becomes smaller. The A-band will always stay the same width. At a full contraction, the thin and thick myosin filaments overlap. So here in these, I just want to remind you of some of the scale of the skeletal muscles. The skeletal muscle is surrounded by the epimesium and contains muscle fascicles. The muscle fascicle is surrounded by the paramecium and contains muscle fibers. The muscle fiber is surrounded by the endomecium and contains myofibrils. The myofibril is surrounded by the sarcoplasmic reticulum and consists of those sarcomeres, which is just the Z-line to Z-line. And then the sarcomere itself contains thick filaments and thin filaments and all the structures that we just talked about. <clears throat> 